Hey guys, welcome back to the vlog and to another study with me video. Uh, today is a fairly chill day, which is the way I like revision to be, uh, where we're sort of taking it at a leisurely pace, doing bursts of active recall and space repetition to maximize efficiency, but not being overly concerned with 100% productivity. And hopefully you'll see that A, we get a lot of work done, but B, it's, it's also quite chill and fun. And I'll also be including 10 study productivity tips, hacks, things that we use throughout the day. So hopefully you'll find those useful. Anyway, I woke up at 8.30 a.m., lay in bed for about 30 minutes doing absolutely nothing slash browsing YouTube, and from 9 till about 10.15, I was editing and uploading one of the revision Q&A videos. Uh, I then had a shower, and this is point number one, uh, one of my productivity hacks, as it were. Uh, normally, I have a shower first thing in the morning to wake me up, but if there's something specific that needs doing that I imagine will take around an hour or less, I jump straight into it and then I use the shower afterwards as a sort of break. From 11.10 to about 11.30, I spend some time tidying my room, tidying my desk, packing my broken drone uh, to send it for repairs. There will be more on this when I put together the vlog about our trip to Singapore and Bali. Point number two, this is another trick that I use uh, before settling down to work. I make sure that my room and my desk are tidy. Yeah, it does sort of waste time in the tidying phase, and I guess you could see it as procrastination from actually doing the work, but I think the overall benefits of having a tidy room and a clean desk are far better for my own mental state than trying to squeeze out that extra 20 minutes of productivity at the expense of a, you know, nice room with good feng shui, as it were. After that, the work session starts. Uh, because I don't like having a revision timetable, I first need to decide what to actually do. And I think to myself, if we had the exam later today, what topic would I be least comfortable with? I decide that if I had to take a history from a patient with a psychiatric issue, like depression or anxiety or suicidal ideation or mania or bipolar disorder, I wouldn't quite remember that. So I spend the next hour or so getting my head around that. And then after I've read over something, for example, Beck's suicide scale, I try and write down from memory exactly what I learned this is point number four, this is active recall in action. There's nothing really fancy about this. I just like using different colors and arrows and, and spacing things out on the page because it gives me more recall cues. For example, at some point, if I forget the Beck suicide scale, it might help me jog my memory that I remember writing down the three components on the right-hand side of the page in green. Then I can remember, oh yes, there were three components. And that cues my recall of, oh yeah, those component components were number one, planning, number two, circumstances, number three, what happens after the fact. So this is why I use different colors and the iPad makes this super easy. Um, but to be honest, I've been using different colors for years, even with paper. Also, it makes the notes a bit more of a pleasure to look at, a bit more of a work of art. You feel like nice when you look at them. There's no understating the importance of that. My friend Catherine and I then spend the next half an hour doing psychiatry history role plays. So putting into action the theory that we did earlier. I act like an asylum seeker from abroad whose family was murdered by men with machetes. And I've got symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. I've got my asylum seeker hearing the following week. And I've taken an overdose of paracetamol because I know that if I get deported, I'll be tortured in my home country. So I might as well end it now. Catherine has to talk to me, ask about my symptoms and assess my suicide risk to work out where we go from here. We then swap roles. Uh, she acts as a young lady with a past history of sexual abuse from her partner. She's been home for the past two years and her dog has just died, which has pushed her into a spiral of depression. She's come to the GP practice with a social worker and I'm acting as the GP and trying to talk to her about what she's been going through so, we, so that we can make an action plan. From 2 to about 2.50 p.m. I make lunch. So I make my usual combination of pasta with tuna and pesto and, and recently I've started adding peas uh, because that increases my green vegetable intake and that's revolutionized uh, my lunch. At around 3 p.m., Paul and Alex, two of our other friends, come up to the kitchen and we decide to do some work. We go over the thyroid, the acromegaly, and the Cushing's examination. Now, there are two little tips here. Point number five uh, is that Paul sat down and he was like, right guys, let's go over some examinations. Uh, how about we do the thyroid? He's taking the lead, he's making us do work, and, and the rest of us, we're sort of in this inertia mode where we'll you know, we're having lunch, we're feeling a bit lazy, but if someone comes along and says, right guys, we're doing work, let's do this, this and this, then we're quite happy to come on board with that. And I think this is important that whenever you're doing a work session with friends, at least one person needs to take the initiative and say, right guys, we're doing this. And then everyone else will sort of follow. If you can't see yourself taking the lead with that sort of thing because you feel like you're not that sort of person that just sort of takes the lead. I would really implore you to work on it. Leadership skills are so important in literally any workplace environment, especially in medicine. You know, it's a good way to practice the skill in a chill setting with your friends rather than, you know, for the first time when you're in a cardiac arrest and you're the, and you're the most senior person on the team. And point number six is something that we do in this little session as well. And that is, you know, this thing that active recall is a way of life. So instead of Paul just going over the thyroid examination and us being like, yeah, that makes sense. We need that. Like instead of being spoon-fed, one of us says, actually, 
can I talk you through it myself and you fill in the gaps that I've missed? In this example, I had done the thyroid examination a few days ago and I forgot some of it, but that's fine because that's the perfect state to be in in order to active recall. Because when you've allowed yourself to forget something and then you're retrieving it, that strengthens the, the connections in that thing. It would have been much easier for Paul to spoo spoon feed us the examination for the thyroid or for us to read it in a book and then be like, oh yeah, I knew that. That requires literally zero brain power. But because we're trying to actively recall it first without looking at the notes, without having it explained in advance, that is going to strengthen the memory ultimately and that's much more efficient. Anyway, also in this session, we draw diagrams for the acromegaly man and the Cushing's man. Uh, this is another important point. This is point number seven, learning by diagrams. I really like learning about diagrams. It's sort of based on what I previously said about queuing recall. And if you can queue a recall of fact or anything based on images, colors, position on the page, these are all things that you can use to your advantage to maximize your efficiency. And because active recall is a way of life, point number eight is that we encourage one another to active recall. So, so for example, if I'm doing the acromegaly examination and I'm trying to remember what the details were, and I remember that, oh, there were five things in the hands. I would say to my friends like, right, guys, don't tell me, don't tell me, I'm gonna get this. And I really try really, really hard to think about what those five things were. The idea is that the more effort this takes, the more strongly that memory is going to get encoded. Right, so that's done. Uh, from 4 to 5 p.m., I've decided I've had enough uh, and do some piano practice. I use this app called Sight Reading Factory, which just generates random pieces for you at your level to, you know, try to learn how to read music and then spend some time catching up on the tech news that I'm interested in and, and reading about what happened at Mark Zuckerberg's Congress hearing. From 5 p.m. till about 6.15 p.m., I go back into work mode and I add the cardiovascular examination to my active recall spreadsheet. So in one column, I write questions that could come up in the exam. And in the second column, I write answers to those questions, but then I color the second column in white so that when I'm looking through the questions, I can't see what's written on them. This is why I like firstly having a big widescreen monitor and secondly, using online slash PDF versions of books rather than physical books. So it's much easier to do a split screen when writing these questions for yourself. And let's call this study tip number nine. This is my magical spreadsheet active recall system, uh, which I've alluded to in this vlog, which will be linked above and below and everywhere. I've also got a magical spreadsheet spaced repetition system, which again, you can read more about in this video or the video link below. So from 6.15 p.m. to about 6.45 p.m., Catherine comes to my room and, he, and she asks what we should do. Uh, I decide to follow point number five. I decide to be a leader. So I offer a default position. I say, all right, Catherine, I've just written these cardiovascular examination questions. Why don't we go over them? And because, you know, it's quite a reasonable suggestion, she's like, oh, great idea. So we sit at my desk and go through these questions together. And this is point number 10. This is something more about active recall. I'm going to keep going on about active recall because it's literally the most efficient way to learn anything ever. What we do is that I read the question out loud and then we both stay silent while we both write the answer down slash think about what the answer would be and only when we're both ready do we look at the answer this means that while we're working together we're still having to use our own brain and our own active recall to get the answers we're not just passively piggybacking on what someone else is doing uh, which would be a really tempting thing to do by about 7 p.m we're done with work for the day overall just under four hours in total but I think it was four pretty productive hours because it was mostly built around active recall, space repetition. In the past, I might've been tempted to like read my textbook, make notes from the textbook, et cetera, et cetera, on these topics. And I would've spent like eight to 10 hours doing the same topics. But because making notes and reading textbooks is so, so, so inefficient, I think I would have learned less than I did in these four quite efficient hours. Then from about 6.45 to about 8 p.m., I filmed the intro for one of the revision Q&A videos. Uh, Catherine helped me set up the lighting, which is very kind of her, and then spent some time editing this video. At 8 p.m., we order pizza from Z's, uh, which is our favorite like pizza place in, in Cambridge. So from about 9.15, we eat. At around 10 p.m., I decided to go to the gym to burn off those calories that I just ate in the pizza. I do a quick session of squat, overhead press, and bench press while listening to the audiobook for The Wise Man's Fear, which is a sequel to The Name of the Wind, which I talked about in, I think, my February favorites video. I then get home, get into bed around 11.30, spend half an hour replying to nice comments and questions that you guys have been sending in on Instagram, and then call it a night. I hope you guys enjoyed the study with me video and learned something from it. Uh, all the best with your revision. See you in the next one. Uh, if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so, and have a good night. Bye-bye.